Hello, okay, dear students. So we'll start with this uh, topic of plant growth and development. Okay, so we had uh, discussed about this earlier. So today's class will be just going through the summary of this plant growth and development. So all the plant cells are descendants of a single cell that is the zygote. Zygote is nothing but a product of fertilization of male and female gamete. So all the plant cells, they are descendants of the zygote or fertilized egg. So their life commences as a single cell uh, condition that is the zygote. So the zygote, you can see in this slide, they develop to form a mature plant through growth and differentiation. So the, when they undergo this maturation, they are going to form the roots, leaves, branches, flowers, fruits, and seeds. Then they eventually die. Okay. So the zygote develops into a mature plant through growth and differentiation. So uh, forming uh, different parts of the plants like roots, leaves, branches, flowers, fruits, and seeds. Then they ultimately die. So you can see in this condition that they, they begin their life as a single cell zygote, that is a fertilized egg. Then they divide to form two cells, two celled embryo, eight celled embryo. Then they form here a globular embryo, heart shaped embryo, torpedo embryo. And uh, finally they further undergo development to form the mature plant. So these are all the differentiations that are taking place from a single cell zygote to a mature plant. So the growth and differentiation leads in their development. So development is from an individual zygote to the adult plant. So those developments, so we call that as the development part of it. So growth and development both are included where there is uh, differentiation also happening. So the cells are also undergoing maturity to form different types of tissues as per their organs. So plant growth here, yeah, that is what we'll begin in the uh, initial discussion of. So growth is defined as an irreversible increase in the irreversible permanent increase in the size of an organ or uh, parts of an individual cell. It involves the metabolic processes that consume uh, energy. So it is an uh, active process also where there is consumption of uh, energy too. So growth is an irreversible permanent increase in the size of an organ or its part of or an individual cell. So it is an irreversible permanent increase. So they cannot grow back to an uh, seedling. So when they develop into an uh, adult plant, so they remain as it is. It is an irreversible permanent increase in the size of an organ or its parts or an individual cell. So this we define it as growth. And growth involves uh, expenditure of energy. It is a metabolic process that consumes energy. So you can see in this slide from a, a simple seedling which has just germinated, okay? And this is a dicot uh, seedling because it is epigeal above the soil. From a simple seedling, they have developed to form the uh, adult plant. So this is what we call it as uh, the metabolic process. Growth is also a metabolic process that consume energy. So plant growth generally is indeterminate. So the plant growth continues throughout the life due to the presence of meristems. So the plant growth is generally is indeterminate. Okay, so there is no definite uh, growth. It grows on throughout its uh, life because of which we call the plant growth as indeterminate growth. So and why they are exhibiting this indeterminate growth due to the presence of meristems or the meristematic cells. So meristematic cells have the capacity to divide and self-perpetuate. They not only have the capacity to undergo cell division, but they can also multiply on their own. They can increase their own self-perpetuate. So the term perpetuate I had explained earlier also. 
so perpetuate means uh, so continue indefinitely so that is the uh, dictionary meaning so meristematic cells have the capacity to divide and self perpetuate perpetuate means continue indefinitely so the meristematic cells continue to undergo cell cell division indefinitely self perpetuate that is what it implies okay <clears throat> the growth where new cells are always added to the plant body by the activity of the meristem is called open form of growth see in case of other animals like even in human beings we grow up to a point after that there is no more growth so growth is determinate in us at a particular age we stop growing so there is only the replacement of dead and worn out tissue this is in case of animals in case of human beings but plant growth is generally indeterminate so wherein they grow throughout their lifetime because of the presence of the meristematic tissues so meristematic tissues have the capacity to undergo cell division and also to self perpetuate so indefinitely continue so the meristematic cells uh, indefinitely they continue to uh, increase in number okay that is the special property of meristematic cells which makes the plant growth to be indeterminate so the growth where new cells are always added to the plant body by the activity of the meristem we call it as open form of growth so new cells are added to the plant body by the due to the activity of meristem we call that as open form of growth so the plant growth is indeterminate so they have different types of growth like primary growth it occurs due to the root apical meristem and shoot apical meristem it causes the longitudinal increase of the plant or elongation of plants along their axis so the primary growth in, uh, is uh, due to the activity of uh, root apical meristem and shoot apical meristem it causes the elongation of plants along their axis okay the secondary growth it is found in case of gymnosperms and dicots so it occurs due to lateral meristems vascular cambium and cork cambium so the secondary growth occurs due to lateral meristems vascular cambium and cork cambium so these cause the increase in girth of the organs okay so the secondary growth in gymnosperms and dicots it occurs due to lateral meristems so the vascular cambium and cork cambium so these cause the increase in girth of these organs that is diameter of these organs so growth is measurable at cellular level growth occurs due to increase in the amount of protoplasm so the cellular level the growth is occurring due to increase in the amount of protoplasm so increase in protoplasm is difficult to measure directly so growth is measured by parameters like increase in fresh weight dry weight length area volume and cell number <clears throat> so at cellular level the growth occurs due to increase in the amount of protoplasm so the growth occurs at cellular level due to increase in amount of protoplasm so protoplasm is difficult to measure directly because they are within the cell so we can measure growth by parameters like what are the parameters to measure growth so there is an increase in fresh weight or dry weight length area volume and cell number so these are measurable parameters so fresh weight dry weight the increase in length area volume and cell number these are the various parameters to measure growth so cell number a maize root apical meristem can produce more than 17000 so this is the maize root so they can produce root apical meristem can produce more than 17500 new cells per hour so that is their uh, dividing capability in case of uh, apical meristem of root so they can produce 17500 new cells so such questions might be asked in your neat examination or cet okay so the uh, in maize uh, dash can produce more than 17500 new cells per hour 
So is it lateral meristem, apical meristem, intercalary meristem, shoot apical meristem? So it is root apical meristem is the answer. Okay. Similarly, the cell size. Cells in a watermelon may increase in size by up to 3,50,000 times. So that's a huge amount, isn't it? A cell in a watermelon may increase in size by up to 3,50,000 times. The length of length is one another parameter for measuring growth. Growth of a pollen tube. So it is measured by the length of this pollen tube. Surface area. Growth in a dorsiventral leaf is measured by the surface area. So these are the different parameters to measure growth at different stages. In maize plant, you can increase in number of cells is one of the parameter to measure the growth. So the cell division, cell number, nearly 17,500 cells are produced per hour due to the meristematic activity, especially the root apical meristem. In case of watermelon, the cell increases 3 lakh 50 times 50000 times in size okay so length you can determine the growth of pollen tube uh, within the ovule so the length the growth of a pollen tube is an parameter to describe length so surface area you can take this parameter in case of a dorsi ventral leaf the amount of area that they are increasing that is due to growth so the phases of growth, different phases of growth are, so the meristematic phase, elongation phase, maturation phase. So meristematic phase, it is because of cell division, cell elongation, cell differentiation. So all these three phases of growth are there. So detection of zones of elongation by the parallel line technique. So you can draw these lines in a young uh, maturing seed and later you can measure them after they have undergone the uh, growth. So here the lines have been drawn, A, B, C, D, immediately behind the apex, that is behind the uh, meristem. So you can notice at certain region, the zone of cell elongation, there is maximum increase in length, okay? And the zone of maturation, so there is no increase in length, uh, so they remain almost similar to that of what we had marked okay so the zones a b c d immediately the behind the apex have elongated the most you can notice this zones which have undergone the maximum elongation immediately after the uh, meristematic zone so meristematic phase it occurs in the meristems at the root apex and the shoot apex Okay, cells in this re region, they have rich protoplasm and large nuclei. So the meristematic phase, so the meristematic tissues, they have rich protoplasm and large nuclei. Cell walls are primary, thin and cellulosic with abundant plasmodesmata. They have this plasmodesmatal connections. So that is the type of meristematic cells in case of root apex and shoot apex. The protoplasm, they have a rich protoplasm and a large nuclei. Cell walls are primary, thin, and cellulosic with abundant plasmodesmata. The elongation phase, it occurs in cells proximal, just next away from the tip to meristematic zone. So cells have increased vacuolation size and new cell wall deposition. So elongation phase, it occurs in cells proximal, just next away from the tip to meristematic zone. Cells have increased vacuolation, size, and new cell wall deposition. So maturation phase, it occurs in the cells further away from the apex, more proximal to the phase of elongation. The cells attain maximal size in terms of wall thickening and protoplasmic modification. In cell elongation phase, the elongation phase, the cells, they are going to uh, so increase in vacuolation so their vacuole size increases so whenever we say the cells are elongating what are all taking place within the cell there is an increased vacuolation size and new cell wall deposition takes place during the elongation phase so there was a, a thin and cellulosic cell wall primary cell wall in case of meristematic phase, but there is a new cell wall deposition taking place in the elongation phase, along with increased vacuolation size. Uh, 
In the maturation phase, the cells further move away from the apex. The cells attain maximal size in terms of wall thickening and protoplasmic modification. They would have attained the maximum size in case of maturation phase. Apart from that, they differentiate as per their uh, a role, they differentiate to form different types of tissue like parenchyma, sclerenchyma, xylem, phloem. So the cells attain maximal size in terms of wall thickening and protoplasm modification in case of maturation phase. And they also differentiate to form different types of tissues like parenchyma, colenchyma, sclerenchyma. So that differentiation takes place in the maturation phase. Now growth rate, there is arithmetic growth as well as geometric growth. So it is growth, it is the increased growth per unit time. So it is growth is increased growth per unit time. The growth rate may be arithmetic, that is numerical or geometrical. So the growth rate may be arithmetic or it might be geometrical, okay? Arithmetic growth in this the following mitotic cell division, only one daughter cell continues to divide while the other differentiates and matures. In this following mitotic cell division, only one daughter cell continues to divide while the other differentiates and matures. So that is what is in case of arithmetic growth. See, you can notice here there are two daughter cells. One of them is going to divide while the other matures. So only one of them is going to undergo cell division. So there is always arithmetic growth here while the other differentiates and matures. So only one cell is undergoing cell division while the other matures and undergoes differentiation. So you can see that they are increasing in number, but they are not increasing in the uh, as in case of the maturation of cell is simultaneously taking place. So on plotting the length of the organ against time, a linear is curve is obtained in case of arithmetic growth. So you obtain a linear curve. So a straight line is formed. Okay. So whenever we are plotting the length of the organ or height of the plant against time, a linear curve is obtained. So that is what we have to remember in case of arithmetic growth. So mitotic in this following uh, type, the mitotic cell division, only one daughter cell continues to divide while the other differentiates and matures. So you can see in this slide. So there are a, a daughter cell device to form two cells. So one of them is going to mature and only the other is going to undergo cell division. So next you find that uh, only this cell undergoes cell division. So only this cell undergoes cell division. The others are different. Uh, they are going to remain. They are going to differentiate and mature. And only one cell is undergoing cell division. So when we plot this arithmetic growth, that is height of the plant uh, against time, we get a linear curve is obtained in case of arithmetic growth. The increased growth per unit time may be arithmetic or geometrical, we have already discussed. So arithmetic growth, it can be mathematically expressed as LT equals L0 plus RT, where LT is length at time T, L0 is length at time zero, R is growth rate or elongation per unit time. So LT is length at time T, L0 is length at time zero, R is growth rate elongation or elongation per unit time. So that is what you can remember. So mathematically arithmetic growth is expressed as LT equals L0 plus RT. So LT is length at time T, L0 is length at time zero, R is growth rate or elongation per unit time. <clears throat> So the next aspect is geometrical growth. Here, both daughter cells continue mitotic cell division. So there is both of them undergo mitotic cell division. Each cell that has divided, again, they undergo mitotic cell division. So that is why they are going to increase in geometrical amount. So the arithmetic growth, you might have understood about this formula, LT equals L0 plus RT, length at any time T and length at time zero is L0. 
R is growth rate or elongation per unit time. T is time, you know that. So geometrical growth, here both the daughter cells undergo continuous mitotic cell division. So in most cells, the initial growth is slow, lag phase, then it increases rapidly, log or exponential phase. So if nutrient supply is limited, the growth slows down, leading to a stationary phase. So whenever the nutrient supply is limited, the growth stops down, leading to a stationary phase. On plotting the parameter of growth against time, we get a sigmoid curve. So when we plot the parameter of growth against time, we get a sigmoid curve, okay? On plotting the parameter of growth against time, we get a sigmoid curve. So in most systems, the initial growth is slow. It is lag phase. Then it increases rapidly, log or exponential phase. The, if nutrient supply is uh, limited, then growth slows down. So leading to a stationary phase or stable phase. On plotting the parameter of growth against time, in geometrical growth, we get a sigmoid curve. So we get a sigmoid curve on in geometrical growth. So whenever we are plotting it against time. On plotting the parameter of growth against time, we get a typical sigmoid curve. A sigmoid curve is characteristic of living organism growing in a natural environment. It is all it is a typical for all cells, tissues, and organs of a plant. Okay, even as human beings, I told you, whenever we grow, initially we have a lag phase when we are developing from infant to an individual. Then there is a sudden period of growth that is after attaining puberty or adolescence, most of them exhibit maximum growth, sudden period of growth, that exponential phase takes place. Then after 18 years, the growth is not much. So this we call it as the stationary phase. So even our growth, human being growth is having the sigmoid curve, so which represents the geometrical growth. So a sigmoid curve is a characteristic of a living organism, which is growing in a natural environment. It is found in all cells, tissues, and organs of a plant. Okay, The exponential growth or this geometrical growth can be expressed as W1 equals W0 e to the power of RT. Okay, e to the power of RT. So W1 equals W0 e to the power of RT. Whereas that was LT equals L0 plus RT. So this is what we had here W1 equals W0 into e to the power of RT. So W1 is final size, W0 is initial size, R is growth rate, T is time of growth, E is base of natural logarithms. So E is base of natural logarithms. So this is what is the exponential growth. The exponential growth can be expressed as W1 equals W0 uh, e to the power of RT. W1 is final size, weight, height, number. W0 is initial size at the beginning of the period. R is growth rate. T is time of growth. E is base of natural logarithms. growth rate here r is relative growth rate okay so that is what we explain in both of them okay so r is relative growth rate it is also the measure of the ability of plants to produce new plant material so the r is relative growth rate it is also the measure of the ability of plant to produce new plant material so we also call it as efficiency index. So hence final size W1 depends on initial size W0. So the final size W1 depends on the initial size W0. Okay. So R is relative growth. It is also the measure of the ability of plant to produce new plant material. So the ability of the plant to produce new mat plant material, we call it as relative growth rate. So the ability of the plant to produce new material, plant material in case of this leaf, A is more than the relative growth rate in case of B is lesser.
so diagrammatic comparison of absolute and relative growth rates so both leaves a and b have increased their area by 5 cm square in a given time to produce a1 and b1 leaves but uh, the relative growth rate is higher in case of a leaf than in case of b leaf so you can notice that okay so final size w1 depends on initial size w0 so quantitative comparisons between the growth can also be made in two ways that is absolute growth rate and relative growth rate so absolute growth rate is measurement and comparison of total growth per unit time okay so relative growth rate is measurement of growth of the given system per unit time expressed on a common basis example per unit initial parameter so absolute growth is measurement of and comparison of total growth per unit time so here in this example it is 5 cm square in a time okay so relative growth rate is measurement of growth of the given system per unit time expressed on a common basis example per unit initial parameter so that is the difference between absolute growth rate and relative growth rate so conditions that are required for uh, growth essential elements which are required for growth water for cell enlargement turgidity of the cell helps in extension growth water provides medium for enzymatic activities needed for growth so water is an important element for growth oxygen it helps to release metabolic energy for growth so oxygen helps to release it helps to release metabolic energy for growth nutrients macro and micro elements are needed for the synthesis of protoplasm and they act as a source of energy so there is requirement of macro and micronutrients for the synthesis of protoplasm and they act as a source of energy so the oxygen is required for metabolic energy for growth during respiration the oxidation takes place and there is release of energy isn't it so oxygen helps to release metabolic energy required for growth growth is an active process you should understand that nutrients macro and micro elements are needed for the synthesis of protoplasm and they act as a source of energy temperature plants have an optimum temperature at which growth is maximum deviation from the uh, this range could be detrimental to its survival so light and gravity they affect certain phases or stages of growth so the light and gravity they affect certain phases or stages of growth so the next aspect that we had discussed is differentiation de differentiation and re differentiation so we had discussed about this i had asked you to remember differentiation as uh, conversion of meristematic tissue to permanent tissue de differentiation as uh, reconversion of permanent tissue to meristematic tissue and uh, re differentiation as reconversion okay so differentiation conversion uh, deconversion and reconversion you can remember it as differentiation is conversion of meristematic tissue to permanent tissue by losing their ability to undergo cell division de differentiation is conversion of uh, the permanent tissue into meristematic tissue uh, by regaining their ability to undergo cell division so this newly formed meristem we call it as secondary meristem especially during secondary growth you find this interfascicular cambium as well as the uh, cork cambium so they are uh, these re differentiation is wherein you find that the secondary meristem which is formed they again lose their ability to undergo cell division and they form permanent tissue so we call that as re differentiation so these three terms we should be knowing about it differentiation de differentiation and re differentiation so differentiation is a process in which the meristematic cells and cambium differentiate and mature to 
perform specific functions okay so they differentiate and mature to perform specific functions so this is happening in the process of root apical meristem and shoot apical meristem as well as cambium they differentiate and mature to perform specific functions in this cell wall and protoplasm undergo structural changes capacity of cell division is lost during the differentiation process so they form the permanent tissue which can be parenchyma colon chyma sclerenchyma that is according to their specific functions they are going to differentiate so during differentiation the cell walls and protoplasm undergo structural changes the capacity of cell division is lost example is loss of protoplasm to form a tracheary element so protoplasm is lost to form a tracheary element they also develop very strong elastic lignocellulosic secondary walls so loss of uh, the protoplasm to form a tracheary element they also develop see they also develop very strong elastic lignocellulosic secondary cell wall to carry water to long distances even under extreme tension so to carry water to long distances even under extreme tension so this process is there under certain conditions leaving differentiated cells they regain the capacity of cell division this is called de differentiation so under certain conditions especially during secondary growth the differentiated cells or the permanent tissue they regain the capacity of cell division this is called as de differentiation example formation of meristems the interfascicular cambium the permanent parenchyma tissue has regained the ability to undergo cell division to form interfascicular cambium in cortex the cambium is formed from the parenchyma differentiates to form a circular cambium and that is again uh, the cork cambium is also example for uh, this particular case from differentiated parenchyma cells okay so these are things that you have to understand about so de differentiated cells can produce cells that gain again lose the capacity to divide but mature to perform specific functions so it is called as redifferentiation so de differentiated cells can produce cells that again lose the capacity to divide but mature to perform specific functions we call this as redifferentiation so plant growth is open it can be determinate or indeterminate differentiation is also open because cells or tissues arising out of the same meristem have different structures at maturity so de differentiated cells can produce cells that again lose the capacity to divide but mature to perform specific functions that is the secondary meristem they lose their ability to undergo cell division and they are going to form permanent tissue so we call that as redifferentiation process so plant growth is open that is it can be uh, indeterminate or determinate differentiation is also open because cells or tissues arising out of the same meristem they have different structures at maturity like from the same meristematic tissue you are going to get parenchyma sclerenchyma epidermis endodermis the pith xylem and phloem they are all arising from the same meristem but they have different structures at maturity as per their genetic makeup so the final structure at maturity of cell or tissue is also determined by the location of the cell if they are located at the periphery they are going to form epidermis okay so the location of the cell also decides what is their final maturity so cells positioned away from the root apical meristem differentiate as root cap cells while those pushed to periphery they mature as epidermis so cells positioned away from the root apical meristem they differentiate as root cap cells while those pushed to periphery they mature as epidermis so that is about the three process differentiation de differentiation and redifferentiation then we discussed about the topic of 
planned development. So development implies, so the definition is all the changes in the life cycle of an organism from seed germination to senescence, that is the uh, old age. So the planned development is, it is a process that includes all changes in the life cycle of an organism from seed germination to senescence. It is the sum of growth and differentiation. So the plant development is nothing but growth plus differentiation. So it includes all the changes in the life cycle of an organism from seed germination to senescence that is aging up or uh, old age. So the plant development can also be defined as sum of growth and differentiation, growth plus differentiation. So it is represented as follows. Let us see here. So the meristematic cells, they undergo differentiation to form a mature cell. Okay. So meristematic cells, they have the cell dividing ability. So they undergo uh, differentiation to form mature cells. So they undergo after cell division, there is cell elongation, maturation to form a mature cell. They might have formed a parenchyma, sclerenchyma or epidermis. And then they undergo senescence. That is, they undergo old age. So they are going to die. So mature cells are going to die after senescence. Okay. So this is what is it is represented as. So the plants follow different pathways in response to environment or phases of life to form different kinds of structure. So this ability is called plasticity. So the plants, they follow different pathways in response to environment or phases of life. So here we found the definition of plant development. So plants, they are going to respond to different environmental factors and phases of life. So in the juvenile stages, some of the leaves, they have a different structure and in adults, they have a different structure. Example, coriander. Here we have this lark spur. So where in the juvenile stage, the leaf structure is completely different from that of the leaf structure of an adult. And this is a terrestrial habitat. So in case of a, a aquatic habitat, so there is a phase of life, different phase of life. This is the example. In juvenile phase, they had a different leaf structure. And in adult, they had a different leaf structure. This heterophily because of different phases of life. Then different aquatic habitat, so different environment, like in water, they have this sort of branched leaves in case of buttercup. So uh, plasticity we can notice in case of plants. So heterophily due to environment, difference in shape of leaves produced in air and water. In water, they have this sort of dissected leaves. In air, they have a different types of leaf. So this is what you notice in case of buttercup. So heterophily is an example for plant plasticity. So plants plasticity is the flexibility that they have. So they follow different pathways in response to environment or phases of life. Plants follow different pathways based on their environment or phases of life to form different kind of structures. So they form different kind of structures at different phases of life or in different environment. So this ability, we call it as plasticity. Example, heterophily due to phases of life. In cotton, coriander, and larkspur, the leaves of the juvenile plants and mature are different in shape. The leaves of the juvenile plants and mature are different in shape. So this is showing the plasticity as per their uh, life phase or different phases of life. Then plasticity because of environment, heterophily due to environment. Example, difference in shapes of leaves produced in air and water. In water, they are highly dissected leaves so that they can keep in phase with the movement of water. Okay, so they do not have more surface area. So the difference in shapes of leaves produced in air and water, example, buttercup. So that is about plasticity of plants that we discussed about. So the uh, 
plasticity heterophily due to phases of life and heterophily due to environment now plant development the factors which are controlling plant development are internal factors within the cell intracellular is genetic factor intercellular in between the cells are plant growth regulators especially the plant hormones so which can either promote or inhibit growth the extrinsic factors are external factors so they are light temperature water oxygen and nutrition so the external factors are light temperature water oxygen and nutrition which controls the plant development so internal factors are intracellular that is in within the cell it is genetic factors intercellular it is like plant growth regulators so now we'll discuss about the plant growth regulators or we also call it as plant hormones or phytohormones hormones are chemical messengers which are secreted in small amount which has its effect at the target region so hormones are chemical messengers which are secreted in small amount which has its effect at the target region so that you should remember about this hormones most of the hormones are proteinaceous in nature but they might also be acidic as we come across abscisic acid then we also come across the uh, gibberellic acids so the plant growth regulators will be studying about plant hormones or we also call it as phytohormones <laughs> the plant growth regulators are small simple molecules that regulate plant growth so based on the function plant growth regulators are of two groups so the plant growth promoters and plant growth inhibitors so the plant growth regulators are small simple molecules which regulate plant growth so based on the function so the plant growth regulators are of two groups so the plant growth promoters and plant growth inhibitors so for growth promoting activities like cell division and enlargement tropic growth uh, pattern formation flowering fruiting and seed formation so we have this plant growth promoters example is auxins gibberellins and cytokinins so the plant growth promoters so the plant growth regulators are small simple molecules that regulate control the plant growth it can either promote or prevent the plant growth so based on the function plant growth regulators are of two types the plant growth promoters like auxins cytokinins gibberellins and the plant growth inhibitors like ethylene and abscisic acid so for growth promoting activities what are the growth activities cell division cell enlargement the growth movement because of tropic growth that is see the stem grows towards the source of light so we call it as phototrophic movement positively phototrophic so the root grows towards the source of water so they are positively hydrotrophic so this tropic movements they grow towards the source of stimulus or away from the source of stimulus that tropic movements is also growth pattern formation flowering fruiting and uh, seed formation they are all growth example so the growth promoters are auxins gibberellins and cytokinins plant growth inhibitors they inhibit growth like what are the inhibiting activities dormancy it can be bud dormancy it can be seed dormancy and abscission formation of abscission layer leads to senescence aging up of the organs and detachment from the mother plant so the abscission layer formation leads to the uh, premature fall of flowers uh, floral buds the buds and uh, even the fruits and leaves they get detached from the mother plant whenever there is an abscission layer formed so these are all growth inhibiting factors so they also respond to wounds and stresses of biotic and abiotic origin so example is abscisic acid and ethylene are example so ethylene fits either of the groups but it is largely uh, a growth inhibitor so ethylene has some of the growth promoting activities also but majority of its activities are growth inhibitor that is the reason we have placed ethylene the only gaseous hormone under the growth inhibitors okay then we discussed about auxins so auxin means to grow 
So Charles Darwin and his son Francis Darwin, they observed that coleoptiles of canary grass, they respond to unilateral light. So whenever they are exposed to unilateral light, their responses grow towards that unilateral light by growing towards the light source, phototropism. So it was coleoptile means you should be able to understand the membrane which is covering the plumule. In case of monocot plants, we call it as coleoptile. Okay, plumule is covered by a membrane coleoptile. The root radical is covered by coleorhiza. So please rec recollect that part of it. So in coleoptile of canary grass, they respond to unilateral illumination by bending towards the source of light. So that is phototrophic movement. So it was concluded that the tip of coleoptile, so they might be causing the bending of the entire coleoptile. So when they detached it, there was no, when they cut this coleoptile tip, they noticed that there was no bending towards the source of light. And if they replace this coleoptile tip, so it bent towards the source of light. So they were able to come to a conclusion that FW went isolated auxin from tips of coleoptiles of wood seedlings. So FW went they isolated auxin from tips of coleoptiles of wood seedlings. Auxin was first isolated from human urine. So auxin was also isolated for the first time from human urine. So FW went isolated auxins from the coleoptiles of wood seedlings, Avena sativa, that is the scientific name of wood. So from wood seedlings, today wood is the most uh, used for dieting, isn't it? They are rich in fibers. So most of them are having this wood meals. So, but during those days, the auxins from tips of this coleoptile of wood seedlings, they were able to obtain this uh, oxen. FW went was able to isolate oxen. So even from human urine, they have isolated oxens. So oxens are generally produced by the growing apices of stems and roots from where they migrate to regions of their actions. So oxens are, are produced by the growing apices of stems and roots from where they migrate to regions of their action. So types of auxins are natural. Example is indole 3 acetic acid and indole butyric acid. So they are isolated from plants. So the natural auxins are indole 3 acetic acid IAA and indole butyric acid IBA. So they are isolated from plants. So the synthetic auxins are naphthalene acetic acid and 2,4-D. That is 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid. So they are synthetic. They are produced in the lab. So I have already discussed about this 2,4-D, which is a dicot uh, VD side. So dicot plants can be removed by, dicot weeds can be removed by spraying this 2,4-D or 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid. So I, uh, for uh, the NEAT also, you should remember this uh, uh, natural auxins, synthetic auxins example as much as possible, okay? Auxins, the physiological functions. So auxins initiate rooting in stem cuttings for plant propagation. So auxins, they are going to initiate rootings in stem cuttings for plant propagation. So you can initiate root formation. So the rhizogenesis, we call it as, or formation of roots from the tip of the stem. So that is formed by this auxins. So auxins also promote flowering. Example, in pineapples, you can notice flowering in pineapples is because of this spraying up of auxins, you can promote flowering. See, even the uh, ethylene gas has the capability to promote flowering in case of uh, the pineapple. So that is why we were saying that ethylene also has certain growth promoting activities. Okay. So auxins, wherever they are sprayed, they prevent the uh, premature fruit and leaf drop at early stages. They are prevented by the auxins. So when plants are sprayed with auxins, uh, they prevent the primitive, premature fall of fruit and leaves at early stages can be stopped. Okay, so they promote the 
abscission of older leaves and fruits so the auxins are not present in older leaves and uh, roots and fruits because uh, the, by their absence they are promoting the formation of abscission layer if they represent they don't get detached from the mother plant so in order to promote the detachment of older leaves and fruits from the mother plant auxins are not present at older leaves and fruits they are present only at the younger leaves and fruits so the auxins induce parthenocarpy that is formation of fruits without fertilization we call it as parthenocarpy example is tomato okay naturally occurring parthenocarpic fruit is banana you know about that so the they are also used as herbicide especially 24d 24 dichlorophenoxyacetic acid is used to kill dicot weeds it does not affect monocot plants it is used to prepare weed free lawns that is what the herbicides are meant for they are used as herbicides 24 dichlorophenoxyacetic acid is used to kill dicot weeds it does not affect monocot plants it is used to prepare weed free lawns so controls xylem differentiation and helps in cell division so they are going to help in so the auxins are going to help in xylem differentiation and helps in cell division so this is what you have to remember in case of auxins so they help in xylem differentiation and help in cell division so 24d i have described in detail wherein i told you that in a paddy plantation which are all monocot plants any dicot plant growing there is a weed they are going to take the nutrients and water meant for this paddy so uh, the earlier process was manually picking them up instead of that we can spray the uh, crops with 24d and especially the dorsi ventral leaf of this dicot weeds they get sprayed more and they get killed so that is how uh, without much of manual labor we can eliminate the dicot weeds in a monocot crop by using this 24d okay so controls the auxins also control xylem differentiation they also help in cell division that is why they are all placed under the growth promoters plant growth promoters auxin is placed under so in higher plants the growing apical bud they inhibit the uh, growth of lateral buds or axillary buds it is known as apical dominance i have already told you about how gardeners they trim the apical bud so that the lateral buds can remove that they can uh, develop so whenever apical buds are there so the auxins are concentrated in the apical buds but if you remove the apical bud so the apical dominance is because of presence of auxins in the apical buds if you remove the apical bud lateral buds develop or axillary buds develop so this uh, dominance of apical bud we call it as apical dominance so removal of shoot tips decapitation results in the growth of lateral buds so this is applied in tea plantation hedge making so especially in parks you might have found the plants which form the hedge or borders so just like compound plant compounds you can call them as or you can call them as hedge plants so you might see that the uh, gardener frequently trims them so that they become bushy and not they and they do not grow lengthwise so the axillary buds are develop whenever you remove the apical bud so the apical bud dominance is because of auxins the next plant growth regulator that we are discussing about is gibberellins these are acidic plant growth hormone so kurasawa treated the sterile filtrates of gibberella fugicurai okay i had earlier to that i stated that so the uh, plant seedlings the paddy seedlings they are affected by this uh, strange disease called as bakane disease or foolish seedling disease which was noticed in japan so the seedlings they showed unusual growth when compared to uh, normal plants and these seedlings they stunted after showing this unusual growth and that was because of infection of the seedling by a fungi gibberella fugicurai so gibberella fugicurai caused the elongation of internodes internodes because they secreted gibberellins 
So gibberellins brings about the internodal elongation. So this foolish seedling disease was also called as bacchanae by the Japanese. So now Kurosawa treated the sterile filtrates of gibberella fujicuri, a fungus that causes bacchanae disease or foolish seedling disease. So he treated the sterile filtrates to healthy rice seedlings. As a result, it showed the symptoms of bacchanae disease. So later, the active substances were identified as gibberellic acid. Today, we know more than 100 varieties of gibberellins. That is GA1, GA2, GA3. So 100 varieties of gibberellins are noticed in fungi and higher plants. So the gibberellic acid GA3 or terpens is one of the first discovered and most intensively studied gibberellins. So gibberellic acid GA3 or terpens is one of the first discovered and most intensively studied gibberellins. So the functions of gibberellins are they cause increase in length of axis. So they are used to increase the length of grape stalk. So to elongate and improve the shape of fruit such as apple. So the gibberellins are required. So gibberellins delay senescence. So the fruits can be left on the tree to extend the market period. So gibberellic acid is used to speed up malting process in brewing industry. So all these are the role of gibberellins. So the functions are gibberellins, they cause increase in length of axis. So they are used to increase the length of grape stalk. That is what you notice to elongate and improve the shape of fruits such as apple. They delay senescence. So the fruits can be left on the tree to extend the market period. Gibberellic acid three is used to speed up malting process in brewing industry. So these are a few functions of the gibberellins. Okay, sugar cane stores sugar in stems. Spraying sugar cane crop with gibberellins increases the length of the stem. I told you the more the internodal distance, better the quality of sugar cane. It increases the yield as much as 20 tons per acre whenever we uh, spray them with gibberellins, the sugar cane plants. Spraying juvenile conifers, the gymnosperms with gibberellic acids, they hasten the maturity period, it leads to early seed production in conifers. So the uh, bolting and flowering, you can notice that. So in most of the plants, so bolting can be induced by gibberellins. So internode elongation just prior to flowering. If that internode elongation doesn't take place, there is no flowering. So we can induce this bolting artificially by spraying the plants with the gibberellins. So especially in beet beetroot plant, cabbages, and many plants with rosette habits. So for them to produce flowers, they should undergo bolting. Naturally, bolting should take place. That is increase in the internodal distance. Uh, we can induce that early by spraying these plants with uh, gibberellins. So cytokinins, so skoog and co-workers, they observe that the internodal segments of tobacco stems they are uh, undifferentiated mass of cells are there, okay? So uh, they observed that internodal segments of tobacco stems, the callus proliferated, that is they increased only if the nutrient medium was supplemented with extract of vascular tissues, yeast extract, coconut milk or DNA. So I told you about the tender coconut water. So even I told you about my lab experiences in preparing this nutrient medium. So this was found in the callus of uh, the tobacco stems. So for them to undergo proliferation, they required this, even this coconut milk. Coconut milk had uh, cytokinin-like hormone in them. Okay, so that is the reason they were required. So Skoog and Miller later identified and crystallized the active substance and they termed it as so especially where was it obtained from extracts of vascular tissues or yeast extract or coconut milk or DNA. So they later identified this as kinetin. So cytokinins were discovered as kinetin that is furfuryl aminopurin an adenine derivative which was obtained from autoclaved herring sperm DNA. Okay, kinetin does not occur naturally in plants. So cytokinins were discovered as kinetin. Okay, furfuryl aminopurin, an adenine derivative from the autoclaved 
herring sperm DNA. So kinetin does not naturally occur in plants. Zeatin was obtained from zea maize and uh, coconut milk. Zea maize is maize. So zeatin was obtained from corn kernels and coconut milk. It is a natural substance with cytokinin-like activity. So kinetin does not naturally occur in plants, but uh, this kinetin, which can induce cytokinesis, was discovered in the uh, autoclaved herring sperm DNA. So that is uh, kinetin, that is N6, furfuryl aminopurin. So there are some synthetic compounds with cell divisions promoting activity. Natural cytokinins are synthesized in region of rapid cell division, especially apex of root, shoot apex, shoot buds, young fruits. So you can notice this natural cytokinins are synthesized in uh, regions where they undergo rapid cell division. So the functions of cytokinins, they play an important role in cell division. So cell division is one of the important factor for plant growth. So they help to produce new leaves, chloroplasts in leaves, lateral shoot growth, and adventitious shoot formation. The cytokinins also help to overcome the apical dominance. So cytokinins, whenever you spray on a crop, lateral buds develop. So they help to overcome the apical dominance. So cytokines promote nutrient leaves. So cousins, the next is plant growth inhibitor. We are going to discuss about the ethylene C2H4. The formula is C2H4. The only gaseous hormone is ethylene and it is a ripening hormone we also call it as. So especially the banana, you can see the different shades of banana. It is induced by this ethylene. Okay. So ethylene is a wonder ripening gas. So anyway, Cousins, the name of the scientist, he confirmed the release of a, a volatile substance from ripened oranges that hastened the ripening of stored bananas. So this was later identified as ethylene gas. Ethylene is a simple gaseous plant growth regulator. So ethylene is synthesized in large amounts by tissues which are undergoing senescence and ripening of fruits. So ethylene is synthesized in large amounts by tissues which are undergoing aging up and ripening of fruits. So ethylene, it influences horizontal growth of seedlings. So the horizontal growth of seedlings is induced by this ethylene, swelling up of axis and the apical hook formation in dicot seedlings. So this sort of apical hook formation in dicot seedlings, it is in initiated by this ethylene. So it promotes senescence. Aging up of leaves is when they yellow up. So it promotes senescence and abscission of plant organs. So ethylene promotes senescence, aging up, as well as formation of abscission layer. So that results in detachment of leaves and fruits from the mother plant and abscission of plant organs, especially of leaves and flowers. So ethylene promotes fruit ripening. It enhances respiration uh, rate during fruit ripening. So we call it as respiratory climactic. So the ethylene promotes fruit ripening by increasing the respiration rate. So we call it as respiratory climactic. So ethylene breaks seed and bud dormancy. They initiate germination in peanut seeds, sprouting of potato tubers. You want them to sprout for planting them. So you can just expose them to ethylene gas. They are going to uh, bring about sprouting of peanuts as well as potato tubers can be brought about by using ethylene. So ethylene functions further rapid internode or PTO elongation in deep water rice plants. It helps leaves or upper parts of the shoot to remain above water. So this also promotes root growth and root hair formation. So the ethylene also promotes root growth and root hair formation, especially here you can see, okay? So it promotes rapid internode or petiole elongation in deep water rice plants. So it is used to initiate flowering and for synchronized fruit setting in pineapples. 
So ethylene gas is used for to initiate flowering and for synchronizing fruit sets in pineapples. It also induces flowering in mango trees. So ethylene also induces flowering in mango trees. It is widely used in agriculture. The most widely used ethylene is ethyphone. So I asked you to remember it as ethyphone. So 2-chloroethyl phosphonic acid. The chemical name is 2-CEPA, C-E-P-A, 2-chloroethyl phosphonic acid. That is ethyphone. So ethyphone is an aqueous solution. It is readily absorbed and transported within the plant. And they release uh, ethylene slowly. So ethyphone hastens fruit ripening in tomatoes and apples and accelerates abscission in flowers and fruits so thinning of cotton cherry walnut it also promotes female flowers in cucumber so the more the female flowers more the yield so it also promotes female flowers in cucumbers thereby increasing the yield the last part of our discussion for the plant growth regulators which is also a plant growth inhibitor is abscisic acid it is uh, labeled as aba so during mid 1960s it was reported three kinds of inhibitors inhibitor b abscission 2 and dormin so uh, which are now chemically identified as abscisic acid so the aba is the derivative of carotenoids so carotenoids are found in carrots they are also responsible for the orange yellow uh, color of fruits they are the pigments Okay, abscisic acid is a derivative of carotenoids. So it regulates abscission formation and dormancy. That is important role. So they inhibit the growth by abscission formation and uh, bud dormancy, initiating the... Uh, so it acts as an inhibitor of plant growth and metabolism. It inhibits seed germination. So they are going to inhibit the seed germination, abscisic acid. It also stimulates the closure of stomata in the epidermis. See, the opening of stomata is initiated by cytokinins. Closing of stomata is initiated by this abscisic acid. Okay, so the abscisic acid is also called a stress hormone because it increases the toler of, tolerance of plants to various kind of stresses. Therefore, we call it as stress hormone. So abscisic acid has an important role in seed development, maturation, and dormancy. So seed dormancy by abscisic acid helps to withstand desiccation, that is loss of water and other factors unfavorable for growth. So abscisic acid has an important role in seed development, maturation, and dormancy. So seed dormancy by abscisic acid helps to withstand desiccation and other factors which are unfavorable for growth. So these are things that you can notice in case of uh, the abscisic acid. It has an important role in seed development, maturation, as well as dormancy. Seed dormancy by abscisic acid helps to withstand desiccation and it also helps to overcome unfavorable growth. So plant growth hormones, they play individualistic or synergistic roles. Such roles, we call it as complementary or antagonistic. So complementary roles, all of them bring about this growth, ethylene, gibberellic acid, auxins, internodal elongation, they bring about, okay. Uh, the growth of the root, initiation of roots is brought about by gibberellins as well as auxins. So cytokinins, abscisic acid, ethylene, they inhibit growth. See, there, there you can notice that they're all having this antagonistic role. So as an individual or as a team. So here it is individualistic or synergistic role you can notice here. So plant growth regulators interact to affect dormancy in seeds or buds, abscission, flowering, senescence, vernalization, apical dominance, seed germination plants, etc. So in most of the cases, abscisic acid, they act as antagonist to gibberellic acid. Let us remember this important one. Abscisic acid acts as an antagonist to gibberellic acid. So factors influencing the action of plant growth regulators 
intrinsic factors which is genetic in nature extrinsic factors are light and temperature and we have discussed under them the photoperiodism and uh, vernalization so role of light and temperature in flowering so photoperiodism in response uh, to of plants to duration of day or night exposure period of day or night exposure so they undergo flowering some plants require light to induce flowering so is accordingly based on the duration of light that they require for flowering plants are of three types long day plants short day plants day neutral plants in long day plants they require the exposure to light for a period exceeding a well defined critical duration so they should be getting light more than the critical uh, photo period okay so short day plants they require exposure to light below the uh, critical period photo period so lesser than the critical duration before the flowering is initiated so day neutral plants they do not have any correlation between exposure to light duration and induction of flowering so light duration doesn't affect their flowering the flower irrespective of the duration of light so we call them as day neutral plants then the, this experiment was there where flowering in a short day plant is suppressed by very low intensity of light and also single flash of light during the long dark period so that affects the flowering so they remain in vegetative state so they require continuous dark duration so while shoot apices modify into flowering apices they cannot perceive photo periods the site of perception of light or dark duration is the leaves leaves perceive what is light and dark okay it has been hypothesized that there is a hormone for flowering so when plants get enough photo period the hormone migrate from leaves to shoot apices the hormone migrates from leaf to shoot apices to induce flowering so that is what we notice vernalization is a phenomenon in which some plants depend quantitatively or qualitatively on exposure to low temperature for flowering so phenomenon in which some plants depends quantitatively or qualitatively on exposure to low temperature for flowering we call it as vernalization so it prevents precocious reproductive development late in the growing season so it enables the plants to have sufficient time to reach maturity so that is what you notice in case of vernalization so it prevents precocious reproductive development late in the growing season it enables the plant to have sufficient time to reach maturity so the vernalization is a phenomenon in which some plants depends quantitatively or qualitatively on exposure to low temperature for flowering so especially examples for vernalization are some food plants wheat barley and rye they have two varieties spring varieties they normally flower in the spring and come to flower and produce grain before the end of the growing season the winter uh, varieties if they are planted in spring they would not produce flowers neither would they produce mature grains with a within a span of flowering season hence they are planted in autumn so in autumn they germinate and are over winter come out as small seedlings they resume growth in the spring and are harvested usually around mid summer so that is what you notice in the uh, winter variety of wheat rye and barley so vernalization in biennial plants biennials they require two seasons for completion of their life cycle biennials are monocarpic plants that is they produce flowers only once in their lifetime and die in the second season example beetroot then there is the cabbages carrots etc so subjecting this plants the growth of a biennial plant to a cold treatment stimulates a subsequent photoperiodic flowering response so cold treatment will initiate photoperiodic flowering response in case of biennial plants or even by gibberellic acid i told you that you can induce bolting and they can undergo a reproductive phase so this is what we had discussed in this entire chapter okay so if you have any doubts or clarifications